Right now on Morning News Now, President Biden on the defensive over a scathing special counsel report on his handling of classified documents that's renewing concerns about his fitness to be president. There's even reference that I don't remember when my son died. How in the hell dare he raise that? I don't need anyone. I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away. But that same report concludes the president will not be charged for mishandling classified documents, but could it impact his chances for re-election? We have team coverage. Also this morning, should he stay or should he go? The Supreme Court weighing whether Donald Trump should be disqualified from the ballot for his alleged role on January 6th. The oral arguments plus the one justice raising questions about whether the Capitol riot was an insurrection. And lawmakers finally moving forward with a new foreign aid bill after Senate Republicans rejected a broader plan that included measures for immigration and border security. We'll break down this new bill making its way through Capitol Hill. And are you ready for some football? That's right, Super Bowl weekend, of course, has finally arrived. We'll take you to Las Vegas for all the excitement. Plus, it's not just the players gearing up. High-profile fans like Taylor Swift getting in the spirit with some custom-made pieces. We'll introduce you to the football wife and fashion designer behind these eye-catching looks. They are very cool. What will you be wearing? <laughs> uh, maybe a Taylor Swift sweatshirt. I got it, okay. <laughs> it's a Taylor Swift ball, right? It, it, <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, Chiefs we'll and see. 49ers, I get For it. But it either is. red or my Taylor Swift sweatshirt. We'll there see. you go. All what right, good you? morning. Good to have you with us. I know. <laughs> just there for the commercials and the food. It'll be fun to watch the football, too. Good to have you with us on this Friday. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to get started this morning with the fallout from the investigation into President Biden's handling of classified documents when he was a private citizen. The special counsel report found President Biden, quote, willfully retained and shared highly classified information when he left his post as vice president. But special counsel Rob Robert Hur said that there was not enough evidence to bring charges against him. The report also delivered a stinging assessment of the state of President Biden's memory, saying he was unable to recall details during his interviews with investigators. The president responded angrily to those claims last night while answering questions from a Fox News reporter. Here's that exchange. How bad totally out. is your memory, and can you continue as president? My memory is so bad, I let you speak. That's you, the, that's you that's what your memory has gotten worse, Mr. No, President. No, my memory is not good. My memory is fine. We have our team standing by to help break down the fallout from this investigation, including NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen. But first, let's be, bring in NBC News justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delaney along with our legal analyst, Danny Savalos. Ken, let's start with you. Just what were the biggest takeaways from this report and, and what could this mean for the president going forward? Good morning, Joe. Well, given that we knew that President Biden wasn't going to be charged in this case, that had been previously reported, the biggest takeaway was the fact that he was recorded in August of 2017, six years ago, saying that he had discovered classified documents, the same ones that were found in his home in Delaware, uh, in another home in Virginia. So that shattered the narrative that as soon as he learned about the documents, he uh, brought in the FBI. Now, the reason he wasn't charged uh, with willfully retaining those documents, according to this report, is because he said he didn't remember that. He quickly forgot about it. And Rob Herr uh, explained that that was credible because Mr. Biden's memory was faulty. And so that's another big takeaway, is the way that uh, Special Counsel Rob Herr had to characterize Mr. Biden's memory throughout the report. And he got he's getting a lot of flack for doing that, some people saying it's gratuitous. But what the Justice Department and Rob Herr would say is that he had to do that because this was a report that was explaining why he wasn't bringing charges against President Biden, even though there is evidence that he willfully retained classified information. Another takeaway is that President Biden, like a lot of presidents, had notebooks and he took notes that had a lot of personal diary-like observations in them and also some highly classified information and that he knowingly took those notebooks home with him. Now, what Rob Hur says in this report is that Biden is not the only president that has done that. Ronald Reagan did that. There were these classified information was sitting in his home for 10 years. So that, that was a mitigating context. And that was another reason that charges weren't brought in this case. And her absolutely distinguished the Biden case from the criminal case against former President Trump. Uh, her says in his report, it's far more egregious, the Trump situation. 
Uh, Mr. Biden is not accused of obstructing justice. Mr. Trump is. So those are completely different universes. But nonetheless, a bad day politically uh, for President Biden. Danny, let's bring you in here. I've got sort of two different questions here for you. First, just what do you make of the way that this was written? Like, had you ever seen anything like it before? And then also, as Ken just mentioned, you know, there's no actual charges here. And there's some reasons listed for why. Tell us about those. This was an indictment without the indictment. And the entire 500-page report for me came down to one shocking word. Mm -hmm. And that word was willful. I have to say, I did not expect the report to conclude that Biden willfully retained these documents. Mm -hmm. I expected him it to find that he inadvertently or accidentally had these documents. But willful is the key element to criminality when it comes to these document retention cases. So what followed after that was even more surprising was essentially the conclusion that there was a crime, at least according to the report, but the reason that charges were not recommended is because uh, the government believed that it could not prove those charges, or I should say more specifically, the special counsel believed that they couldn't prove that those charges because this would be a sympathetic defendant. That, to me, was very surprising. Not because the government considered it, they should make those considerations, but that uh, the degree to which they said, well, here's a guy that came here and said, I don't remember, and I think a jury would find him sympathetic. Oh, if only the government would do that for all the defendants that nobody's ever heard of. Hey, mm. uh, the defendant doesn't remember committing the crime, so you know what? Hey, we're, we're all good. Everything's fine. You don't see that in normal life. So unlike President Biden, the former President Donald Trump has been charged with his handling of classified documents. That's the case out of Florida. And the special counsel did make a point of saying these are two very different cases. Explain the differences and, and what he laid out. The massive difference between former President Trump and President Biden is that from the moment the inquiry was raised, uh, former President Trump allegedly did a lot of things to conceal those documents, to move them around and to obstruct justice and obstruct the investigation. Now, interestingly enough, this is one of those crimes where that act can be powerful consciousness of guilt evidence. Whereas in the case of Biden, uh, there's no, no doubt that from the get go, he basically said, have at it. Search wherever you like, you have my consent. And while that will not prevent uh, a prosecution, believe me, that does not exonerate him. It should be mitigating evidence. And that's really what this was in this report. It didn't negate the finding of willful taking, retention, dissemination of this information. But apparently it was such powerful mitigation evidence that the special counsel concluded that they should not bring a prosecution. But make no mistake about it, to me, I read the report as saying uh, all the elements of a crime are there. Mm. We just think there are other reasons why we couldn't prove this case. Ken, of course, the other big part of what came out here was the issue of President Biden's memory sort of being put front and center in this. Uh, for instance, the report stated that he was unable to remember when his son died. We played a little bit of this for viewers a moment ago, but let's listen to what the president had to say in response. I know there's some attention paid to some language in the report about my recollection of events. There's even reference that I don't remember when my son died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. Walk us through how her came to this conclusion in his report, exactly what it said about his memory. Yeah, I think it's really unfortunate that the report mentioned his son. That seems to be a political error by the special counsel, because obviously Mr. Biden remembers when his son died, even if he got the date wrong at one particular point. But look, this is a transcribed interview, so it either happened or it didn't. Uh, but her details a lot of other rather startling failures of memory by Mr. Biden, that he couldn't remember uh, when he was vice president, which particular years, that he couldn't remember which side of a debate he was on in, 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 over the war in Afghanistan, which was one of his signature issues as vice president. And the reason her had to put it in there, again, is because he was writing a memo to the attorney general about why he wasn't bringing charges, why he was declining to prosecute in the face of evidence that Mr. Biden had intentionally taken the classified information. And why is this why is this public? Normally, you don't. a prosecutor doesn't discuss the conduct of people they aren't charging. It's public because the special counsel regulations required him to write this report, and Attorney General Merrick Garland had vowed a long time ago to make all these special counsel reports 
public. Now, he's getting criticized for that by Democrats, but he was in a really tough spot. And imagine the outcry if Merrick Garland had decided not to make this public or had tried to edit it in some way to favor Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. All right. Ken Delaney, and thank you so much, Danny. You're going to stick around to help us break down the Colorado ballot hearing in just a moment. For now, let's take a closer look at the political fallout surrounding this report. NBC News senior national politics reporter John Allen joins us on this. John, good morning. So Trump and Republicans have already been critical about Biden's age, you know, before this report. But we've also seen in polling that his age and his memory have been a topic of concern for voters nine months out from the election. What do you think? What are the political consequences here? It's a great question, Savannah. Uh, obviously, we're not going to know exactly what they are for many months, and we'll see, um, you know, the extent to which uh, this continues to be, uh, this particular report that we uh, have have now seen continues to be an issue for Biden. Uh, but it is absolutely the number one thing uh, in polls that you see uh, that voters are concerned about. It's not just Republicans who are concerned about his age. There are also many Democrats who are concerned about his age. And uh, the, the age question is often a proxy for, um, you know, for concerns about his mental acuity. And so uh, when you look at this report coming out yesterday that says, uh, you know, basically they didn't charge him because they found him to be a nice elderly man with, uh, with memory lapses, um, that is, you know, politically damaging to Biden. Don't take my word for it. Uh, I spoke to several Democratic operatives uh, and a member of Congress yesterday who, um, you know, basically all said that this is a nightmare. So, yeah, and John, so there are many who, who feel that then Team Biden needs to do something to try and reassure voters that his age and health won't be an issue. Do we know, is there a plan in place? How do they plan to address this issue during the election? I mean, the first way that they're trying to address it uh, is through uh, his remarks last night at the White House, uh, you saw, uh, you know, Biden uh, fiery at one point. You guys showed the clip there. Uh, he used the words hell and damn. Uh, Biden, you know, Biden in private quarters is well known to use uh, stronger language than that. But typically in public, when he uses words like that, he's really uh, trying to emphasize his um, his anger. And, uh, you know, that anger, I think, is a, a sign of, uh, of vitality. Um, it, more broadly, he took questions last night. He typically doesn't take a lot of questions from reporters, but he took uh, several questions from reporters. So I think that was an effort on the a part of the White House to start addressing that uh, last night. Um, you know, unfortunately for Biden, uh, there was a moment when he mixed up the uh, Egyptian leader with the Mexican leader um, after having gone back to the podium to take one last question. He was walking away. He was done with the press conference and then uh, decided to answer one last question and had a, um, you know, an, an error that is typical of some of the ones he's had recently. John, of course, former President Trump has his own problems when it comes to the handling of classified documents after being in the White House, something that Joe pointed out. He's facing federal charges over that. Um, as Danny said, there are clear uh, differences in just the fact that ultimately nothing is, is being pursued here. But does this report neutralize that at all? Do you think this sort of as a political issue in November, just the fact that there are similar headlines about both of these men? And for people who uh, love Donald Trump, uh, this absolutely neutralizes this issue. For people who love Joe Biden, it absolutely does not. Um, and, you know, the key question is going to be, uh, at least with regard to these particular cases, uh, whether that small set of persuadable voters looks at this as a situation where uh, they both kind of did the same thing and one of them is being, uh, you know, exonerated and one of them is being prosecuted. Um, to your point, Danny, Danny made the point, and as did the special uh, special prosecutor here, uh, made the point about the distinction between these two things. That may be lost on uh, on folks who don't pay a ton of attention uh, to, to the daily twists and turns, but also go out and vote. Mm -hmm. All right. So important. John Allen, thank you so much. Good to see you. Now, the fate of former President Trump's appeal to stay on the Colorado primary ballot now in the hands of the Supreme Court. Now, the high court heard arguments yesterday over whether the state of Colorado has the power to remove Trump from the Republican primary ballot because of his alleged meddling in the aftermath of the 2020 election that led to the January 6th attack at the Capitol. The justices expressed doubt that states can use the 14th Amendment's insurrection clause to bar presidential candidates from the ballot, giving Trump confidence they will rule in his favor. It's unfortunate that we have to go through a thing like that. I consider it to be more election interference by the Democrats. That's what they're doing. I think it was well received. I hope it was well received. 
You have millions of people that are out there wanting to vote, and they happen to want to vote for me or the Republican Party, or whatever you want to, however you want to phrase it. Danny Savalos joins us once again. So one of the questions here is, you know, perhaps different states could come to different conclusions as to whether a candidate like the former president should be on the ballot, which raises the question, maybe it's Congress that should be in charge of actually enforcing this Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. What were your big takeaways from this two-hour hearing? Yeah, there are so many complex legal and constitutional issues here, so I'll try to boil them down. And really, uh, the challenger, excuse me, the disqualifiers here face their toughest questioning from the liberal-leaning side of the court. And those justices basically ask the question point blank, how do you reconcile that a ruling in your favor would allow a single state to take away, to decide a presidential election. I mean, you could take it further. You could say four, uh, four judges on the Colorado Supreme mm. Court end up making that decision. How do you square that? And it is a powerful question. I think it came from Justice Kagan or Jackson. They had some of the toughest questions for the disqualifiers. And as to the nitty gritty, there are so many different complex issues. Number one, does this even apply to a candidate and not an actual office holder? Can you elect him and then deal with the thorny issue of, hey, we just elected some Somebody who's not qualified to be the president. Uh, there are a number of other potential legal issues, but all of these are off ramps uh, for the justices to, to decide this case in favor of Trump. Any one of them goes against the disqualifiers and it appears they lose. Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson was the only one who really kind of dug in on the concept and definition of insurrection and pushing Trump's team on whether or not that happened. How important is that just for kind of being established here? Did that moment matter a lot in this context? And how did Colorado do on that point? Oddly enough, compared to the other constitutional issues, it may be a, of lesser importance. Consider, for example, a finding that Donald Trump engaged in insurrection. Well, that is a fact-intensive filing, and in fact, a finding rather. And in fact, Colorado used an expert to interpret words by Trump, right? Mm. Well, those are all specific findings of fact in a specific court. Another court in another state, another secretary of state outside of court, they may arrive at a different set of facts using a different kind of due process process or procedure. So uh, that's probably why the Trump team didn't really focus on the actual insurrection as much as people thought they might, because right. it doesn't really help them. What really helps them is a finding that Donald Trump is not an officer within Section 3. Why? Because that would be a global finding, one of the few global findings that would apply nationwide, and it would end this mm. uh, for the Trump team. Whereas, for example, if you find that Donald Trump didn't get due process, hey, he didn't get due process in this case. Well, then you just go right back and give him more due process, and then you raise the same challenge again. Or if they argue this is a political question, it can't be decided by the courts, well, then you just have the Secretary of State make the decision. Now that's no longer a defense. So the Trump team focused on the officer argument because it's one of the few global arguments that will win this and put it to bed for the Trump team once and for all. All right, we'll see if we get this decision by Super Tuesday, the Colorado primary, which is in early March. Yep. Danny, thank you for everything this morning. Appreciate it. Outside the Supreme Court chamber, for former President Trump is a step closer to winning the Republican nomination. NBC News projects Trump has won the Nevada caucuses pretty handily with more than 99% of the vote. This is Trump's fourth straight win this primary season. Former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley was not on the ballot. Instead, she chose to take place, take part, excuse me, earlier this week in the state's primary that she lost despite facing no major challengers. With the win, Trump takes all 26 Nevada GOP delegates. NBC News also projects the former president is the winner of the Republican caucuses in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Mr. Trump is expected to take all four delegates that were up for grabs there. All right, a week ago, Punxsutawney Phil predicted in early spring this year based on this weekend's forecast. A week later, he just might be right. That's right. I mean, some of the country's really warm. Let's confirm with our own experts. We respect your opinion much more here. Michelle Grossman, good morning. <laughs> Good morning, guys. Great to see you. Happy Friday. And Phil is right, at least for now. We're back to reality by early next week. But we're going to see temperatures 10, even 30 degrees above normal for this time of year. It's going to feel like late March, early April, even mid-April in some spots. That jet stream so far to the north, that's allowing that southerly flow to come in. So that's allowing milder air to come in. And we're looking at lots of 60s on the map today, 70 degrees today in Little Rock. That is 17 degrees above what is typical for this time of year, 70s in St. Louis, Washington, D.C. 
DC, 62 degrees, 17 degrees above average. And we're looking at 60s in Kansas City, Oklahoma City, Cleveland, and right around 60 degrees in Syracuse, New York. It's going to be another warm day tomorrow, so kicking off the weekend really warm. And then we're going to uh, kind of go backwards on Sunday and then back to reality, certainly by Monday and Tuesday. Tomorrow, uh, uh, this is actually Saturday, we're looking at 62 degrees in Philadelphia, 20 degrees above normal, 68 degrees in Richmond, 59 in Beckley, uh, Nashville also looking at 67 degrees. And there's your reality check as we go throughout next week in New York City, Monday back to 46 degrees and just 41 on Tuesday. We could even see a little snow, maybe some ice, uh, some really cold rain on Tuesday. We'll talk more about that in a second. Otherwise, today we're looking at the chance for some snow in the West. It remains unsettled there in parts of the Intermountain West. Also, the northern and central Rockies could see a six inches, even a foot of snow in some spots. Looking at some PM storms in parts of Texas into Arkansas, Tennessee, a little bit into uh, the Tennessee Valley. So as we go throughout tomorrow, we're looking at that stretching. As we go throughout the south, across the south, we're looking at periods of heavy rain, could see some thunderstorms. Some of these storms could contain some hail, even some heavy rain. So we do have a chance for flooding in portions of the south tomorrow. And then as we go towards the northeast, the inner uh, uh, most part of the Northeast into parts of New England. We're looking at showers there. Intermountain West contains uh, some snow. We're looking at some really cold air in place. So we're looking at that expanding into parts of the Rockies as well. Dry West Coast. So we're looking good uh, the West Coast finally. Sunday, same story. And then we'll end it here, guys, because we are looking at severe risk on Sunday in portions of the South. Again, could see some flooding rains. And we're looking at a really nice forecast in Las Vegas. I'll show you that next hour. We're looking at low temperatures in the 50s and lots of sunshine there. Back good to you both. News for those going to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Thanks. Well, Michelle. Thank uh -huh. you much more to come here on Morning News Now later this hour. Super Bowl weekend, of course, in Sin City, and we can feel the excitement in Vegas and beyond. We're going to catch up with NBC Sports legend Mike Tirico for his take ahead of the big game. But first, after the break, enter the year of the dragon. We are celebrating Lunar New Year, a look at the history behind the holiday. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back this morning. A massive foreign aid bill that would provide assistance to Israel, Ukraine and Taiwan is moving a step forward on Capitol Hill. The bill cleared a key procedural hurdle on Thursday, gaining some Republican support. While this new piece of legislation is being considered by the Senate, it's still unclear if the aid package will get enough support to actually pass both chambers. Thursday's vote came just one day after Republicans rejected a broader bill that also included border security and immigration measures. For more, we are joined by NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin. Julie, good to see you. So the road out of the Senate will not be an easy one for this $95 billion aid package. So tell us what is now in it at this point and then what happens now that it passed that first procedural hurdle. Yeah, that's just the first procedural hurdle of many. Good morning, guys. Well, this bill, you see it on your screen. It's basically back to October. We're an endless Groundhog Day on Capitol Hill. That's because this bill is just that aid package for Ukraine, for the war in the Middle East. It includes some of that humanitarian assistance. Also, it provides aid to the Indo-Pacific region. Notably absent is anything to secure our southern border. Of course, this was a point of discussion over the last couple of months. This came after Republicans, of course, rejected a package with the bipartisan security measures in it. Now they're moving ahead with this other package without the border measures. And the reason I say it's the first procedural hurdle of many is because there is not going to be a time agreement, meaning unanimous consent from all 100 senators to move forward on this process. Just 17 Republicans uh, voted in favor of this uh, package with almost all Democrats. So certainly this is going to be an uphill battle and certainly they're going to be in town all of the weekend, including Super Bowl Sunday. This is a critical time for Ukraine. Nearly all Democrats agree with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says passage of the bill is essential. Republicans do still seem split. So what are you hearing from Senate Republicans right now? Yeah, that's exactly right. Ukraine has been a topic over the last several months, especially in the House, uh, where there is an uphill climb among Republicans to get this package passed. Of course, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer remains fervent that they have to move forward on this. And he has some backup from powerful Republicans across the aisle in the Senate. What do we know right now about where Speaker Mike Johnson weighs in on this? Well, I had some sources who told me that Speaker Johnson communicated to not only the minority leader, Mitch McConnell, but also some of his hardline conservative allies in the Senate that he's likely going to have to split this package up, meaning if the Senate does manage to pass this over the finish line, which at this point it's looking like they might, uh, it might take some time, but it, they might actually get this through. The House is actually going to split that package up, most likely, uh, because there is no support to pass this together. He's facing them, some threats even to remove him from the 
Speaker's office, from hardliners like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's really not in favor of sending what she calls a blank check uh, overseas to Ukraine. But then there is this border security piece of this. And certainly some Republicans are concerned that they're now going to fund those overseas wars without securing our southern border. Of course, there was that bipartisan deal that they themselves tanked. So they are in a political pretzel, you guys. Uh, and only time will tell how this gets settled. A political pretzel. I like that. Julie Serkin, thank you. Well, believe it or not, the Super Bowl isn't the only big celebration this weekend. Over 2 billion people across the globe are set to observe Lunar New Year. 2024 marks the year of the dragon. The holiday is celebrated in a number of Asian countries and communities filled with parades, food, fireworks, and other great festivities. Nico Lee, artistic director and programs manager of New York's Chinese Cultural Center, joins us now. Good to have you with us, Nico. Thanks for being here. Let's start off by talking about the significance of Lunar New Year and why it's celebrated on February 10th. Tell us about that. Oh, yes, of course. So um, Lunar New Year, also known as a spring festival in China, and it's a celebration of the arrival of spring and the beginning of a new year on the lunar solar calendar. It is the most important holiday in China and is also widely celebrated in South Korea, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, and countries with a significant of overseas Chinese population. And also 2024 is the year of a dragon. So starting from tomorrow, February 10th, Savannah, as you said, um, and ending on January 28th, 2025. And because it's the year of the dragon, my understanding <clears throat> is that's the only mythical creature in the Chinese zodiac. Explain the meaning, the significance behind the dragon. Sounds like a cool year. I feel, yes, it's because of, you know, the animal has such a strong symbol and well-known mascot in Chinese culture. So also dragon ranks fifth in the 12 year cycle, of the Chinese zodiac signs. Um, throughout Chinese history, the dragon has represented good luck, justice, prosperity, and strength. And the fact that when, um, you know, this particular animal dragon, especially in the ancient China in the history, uh, only the emperor has the privilege to wear anything or use anything that has a dragon on it. So mm. definitely this year when people talk about, oh, it's a year of a dragon, um, everyone connects, you know, mm. uh, from whatever stories or anything that you've learned and you've heard before about Chinese culture, about Chinese New Year, Lunar New Year. Uh, so definitely dragon, it is important, not just within uh you know, the community here, but I think it's just for anyone from different cultures that know about it. Absolutely. And Nico, also, we want to ask you about the mission behind your work at the Chinese Cultural Center. Um, tell us about the awareness that you spread and how your center is going to be celebrating this weekend. Yes, we have been uh, working nonstop since the last fall, rehearsing and preparing programs for uh, this Lunar New Year. Uh, we have, um, you know, programs throughout the city and the tri-state area, everywhere you can find. Go to our website, www.nychineseculture.org, and to find all the information and different events. This particular weekend, we will be uh, at Hassan Yards, and we will be at Queen's Museum. Uh, we have uh, different programs lined up, whether it was in public schools for educational programs or public events for performances. And so we're everywhere. So uh, go <laughs> and find us and you will see us everywhere. Yeah. Nico, thank you very much for joining us and happy Lunar New Year. Enjoy this weekend. Thank you. Happy New Year. <laughs> thank you. All right, coming up, taking control. More air traffic controllers could be the key to ending long delays and flight cancellations. After the break, more on the efforts to train the next generation and solve a crippling shortage. That's next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. Time for what's making financial headlines. The FCC is taking action against AI-generated voices on robocalls. CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us on this Friday morning. Hey, Bertha, good morning. 
Hey, good morning, guys. Yeah, I wish they would ban all robocalls, but the FCC is banning robocalls that use AI-generated voices. The ruling uh, gives state attorneys general the power to take action against callers using AI voice cloning technology for non-emergency purposes without prior consent. Scrutiny of AI voices and robocalls has really ramped up recently. Recall last month, some residents in New Hampshire received calls that appeared to use AI to impersonate President Biden's voice, telling them not to show up at the polls for the state's primary. Zillow, meantime, has launched an option to search for individual room listings as Americans struggle with higher rent and housing costs. Zillow's app now includes a room filter under the home type drop down menu. You can search for a room in a single family rental, condo, or townhouse based on your budget, your lifestyle, and preferred location. Now, the feature is available nationwide, but Zillow says it's expected to be especially popular in larger cities like Los Angeles. Angeles, Boston, and Atlanta, where, you know, housing affordability is, is tough for people. New York City is another place where it's tough, but New York City is experiencing the tightest housing market in more than five decades. A new survey finds just 1.4% of rental apartments are vacant and available. That's the lowest vacancy rate since 1968 and qualifies as what people are calling a housing emergency. New York's housing agency says residential construction has failed to keep pace with demand, especially for affordable homes. As a result, lower income residents are spending more than half of their income on rent. Mm. We're, you know, trying to move further away from the city, which then means they spend more on commuting. Mm. It's a really tough situation for a lot of folks here. It is. Yeah. It feels really out of hand. Big issue right now. Bertha, thank you so much. Thanks, Bertha. Well, there's an urgent push to hire more air traffic controllers. And of course, this is right as passenger levels are surging. The shortage of controllers contributed to massive flight delays and cancellations last year. Well, our NBC's Tom Costello went inside the FAA Academy as they tried to quickly train the next generation. Runway 28 right at Charlie, clear for takeoff. For a high stress, high stakes career. Foxtrot Papa is on frequency. It all starts here. Left turns, expect further clearance. The Air Traffic Control Academy in Oklahoma City is full as the FAA pushes to staff up understaffed towers and centers. The FAA says it needs 1,300 more controllers. The controllers union says 3,500 are needed. The FAA is struggling to keep up with mandatory retirements at 56. How long will it take you to get to full staffing? Our goal is, is five to seven years to be fully staffed and comfortable. Every year, 1,500 new students go through the academy. It's here the controller candidates are trained for either the control tower or an in-route center, handling air traffic at 18,000 feet or above. The students who seem to do the best are often video gamers. What is it about gaming skills that could make you a good controller? The ability to take in all of that information quickly, make a quick decision, and then if that decision is not the right one, being able to come up with a plan B or plan C. But the academy washout rate is high, 30%. After the academy, up to three years of on-the-job training, where another 30% quit, often over stress and long shifts working weekends and holidays. 2019 graduate Janessa Milners now controls Los Angeles airspace. It was one of the most intense things I've done in my life. Um, just because you, you're trying so hard to, to make it through. Falcon 7350, hotel, go around. The simulations as real as possible. Now's the time to make mistakes, right? Don't be nervous, okay? Just follow through with everything, okay? Cat Hotel, Delta 802, ready for departure. Tabletop exercises teach spacing and runway orientation. The FAA is also recruiting veteran military controllers and college program grads who go straight to on the job training to think three to four to five steps ahead. That is the type of person that it takes to do this job. In a business with little room for error, every detail matters. Tom Costello, NBC News, Oklahoma City. What a neat inside look there. Thanks, Tom. Coming up, we're going big for the big game. Super Bowl, of course, just two days away. That's right. Between the big game, Usher's halftime show, the commercials, maybe even little Taylor Swift sprinkled in there. Oh, yeah. There's going to be something for everyone. When we come back, we're going to get caught up with NBC sports legend Mike Tirico. Stay with us. You're watching Morning News. 
Welcome back. The anticipation has been building all week. Now we're just a couple days away from Super Bowl 58. It's going down in Las Vegas, a place pretty familiar with big parties. NBC's Jay Gray is there with a closer look at the hype. Bold, brash, Las Vegas, a place where over the top is, well, ordinary. And from the minute you set foot on the strip, you can't escape the Vegas vibe. I mean, if you're walking around, you see the lights, you feel the energy, the atmosphere. And now, for the first time ever, this city built on gaming is hosting the biggest game of all. Fans already flying in from across the country to be a part of the party. As soon as you get off the airplane, you start seeing things related to the Super Bowl and just, like, get all pumped up for the game. And those that live here say the energy and excitement has reached a new level this week. Oh, it's awesome. It's a great feeling to, uh, to be a Niner fan and be able to enjoy it in our, in our hometown. A place that seems to be a perfect match for the Super Bowl. This is an entertainment town. This is a sports town. It's an event town. But until 2020, when the Raiders moved to Vegas, it was not an NFL town. The league and even some of the players worried about the influence gambling could have on the game. There's no place in the NFL for gambling. But times change. Nice job, Coach. Archie Manning and his Super Bowl MVP sons, Peyton and Eli, now starring in a commercial for online betting with the NFL and fans betting on a Super Bowl that will live up to the hype of the host city. Jay Gray, NBC News. Las Vegas. For more on the countdown to the Super Bowl, we're joined by NBC Sports host, Sunday Night Football play-by-play -play announcer, Mike Tirico. Mike, so good to have you with us. So this is the first time Vegas is hosting a Super Bowl. What's the energy like on the ground? Well, it's uh, four whatever in the morning, and the casinos are full. So it's like oh every other goodness. Thursday night, Friday morning in Vegas, right? <laughs> but I think this is the perfect place for a Super Bowl. Over the years, if you couldn't be at the Super Bowl, Vegas was the next best place to be because there was always a big party code going on. And that's just continued, except we've added the Super Bowl site on top of it. They know how to do big events here. The city knows the, the NFL, as you heard in the piece, because of the Raiders' presence, the whole legalization of sports gambling by various states around the country. You used to have to come here to bet or go down to some corner bar with a bookie. Now it's all in the open, it feels. So I think there's less concern about that. And this is the perfect time for Vegas and the Super Bowl to come together. Perfect marriage. You can see the Super Bowl coming back here after this for sure. Mm. Mike, this is a rematch, right? Four years in the making. The Chiefs beat the 49ers back in 2019. Uh, this year, how are the teams stacking up? Well, the Chiefs, this is on their schedule, it feels like. Patrick Mahomes, their quarterback, had a great line this week. He said, well, I'm just into my normal Super Bowl week routine. That means you've been through it a few times, and he has three of the last four. So they continue to have their success. San Francisco on the other side, they had, I thought, the best team in the NFL last year. And then their quarterback, Brock Purdy, got hurt in the first quarter, the first drive of the NFC Championship game. So they built the whole year to try to get back here, and they did. So even though the Chiefs have been on the Super Bowl stage more, you mentioned the rematch from four years ago, I feel like it's two teams that we expected to see here. And I think if Brock Purdy plays well, you're going to see a terrific Super Bowl like we did last year when the Chiefs beat the Eagles. Mm. All right, you have a question about Taylor Swift, right? <laughs> sorry. Actually, who am I kidding? I'm not sorry. Mike, we have to talk about it. Taylor Swift, pretty sure she's coming, flying straight from a show in Tokyo. One of the things that got my attention this week was, yeah. that was Donna Kelsey telling the Today Show that she thinks she'll just be in the stands because it's too expensive, which I find very hard to believe. But what do we know at this point about what Taylor's going to be up to Mike, you're now a Vegas? Taylor Swift reporter. Yeah. How do you feel about this? <laughs> What do you mean now? I mean, yeah. this has been the story of our year. The, the first time she showed up was week three, I think it was, against Chicago. Then we had the Sunday night game in New Jersey against yeah. the Jets where that was the beginning of, oh, Taylor's here. She's walking in the stadium. Oh, my gosh, let's cover that. Look, it's cool, right? It's so cool. Yes, it's the biggest you, entertainment Mike. star in America, if not the world. Uh, if she's at the game, like Jack Nicholson back in the 80s and 90s with the Lakers, you put a celebrity on TV. She's on, New York Times did a great study of this, on average, 35 seconds out of a three-and-a-half-hour game. Is it really changing anybody's life? They're not missing any replays no. of a pulling guard or a defensive end or any of that stuff. It's Amen. just really cool. And what it's done, which I think is neat as a, a 
guy who's got a daughter who loves football. Oh. It's gotten more daughters to talk to their dads <laughs> about football and watch the game and run around wearing, I'm rooting for Taylor's boyfriend and all that <laughs> stuff and T-shirts, you name it. So it's great. And any business that doesn't want growth and new eyes is a business that doesn't succeed. There's one thing the NFL Damn. does, and that's succeed. So this is great for everybody all the way across the board, at least from where I sit. So, Mike, speaking of success, just who do you got a prediction? Who do you think is going to win this one? Of course I do, but I'm not going to share it because <laughs> I've got to cover these teams next year. But here, here's a key for me. Kansas City's defense, which we don't talk about because of Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey, Taylor's boyfriend, and their great offensive weapons over the years. <laughs> their defense has been outstanding this year. I did that just for you. Their defense has been outstanding this year. Kansas City's defense to me is the key. If San Francisco can run the ball early on in the game, that means we're going to have a big high-scoring game. If not, then the Chiefs have a chance to win the game. So as you're sitting with your friends, if you're saying San Francisco's running the ball effectively, this is going to be a high-scoring good game, tell them I said that. If that doesn't happen, just forget I said it. All right. Also, can I just point out, Mike Tirico equals sports, and that was his take on Taylor Swift. There you go. There Mike, you go. Mike, look what we made <laughs> Thank you do. You. <laughs> You've just made Joe oh, do. Oh, you know what? <laughs> hey, look, if you want me to go down the lyrics and the song titles, I did that week four. I've got them yeah, all somewhere back in my brain awesome. so we can do that. <laughs> Mike Tirico, thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend. Yeah, enjoy all right? it. See you soon. Of well, course, you all too. Thanks. Looking for one of the most fashionable ways to show support for your team during the Super Bowl. We've got you covered. Custom pieces handmade by Christian Juszczyk, who's married to a 49ers fullback. They've taken over the NFL sidelines, even been worn by Taylor Swift to even Simone Biles. Well, our NBC News contributing correspondent Kaylee Hartung had the chance to sit down with the Red Hot designer. Did you pack the sewing machine for Vegas? <laughs> I did not pack the sewing machine, but I definitely brought myself a kit. I have like a fanny pack. This one woman show has taken the NFL by storm. Kristen Juszczyk's custom handmade jackets and one of a kind head to toe outfits are changing the fashion game. I've always just been wanting to wear something unique. I just had that moment where I'm like, I can't find it out there to buy. The only other option is to create. Spotted on the sidelines of 49ers games, there's Kristen rocking her latest creations and proudly supporting her husband, fullback Kyle Juszczyk. How many Juszczyk jerseys have you bought just to cut up? I've probably gone through like 30 of Kyle's jerseys. She's been outfitting herself for the past five seasons, but this year she challenged herself in a new way. My goal was to start making something for myself every week and then also something for somebody else, which is a challenge because these are very time consuming and they're very intricate. I definitely surpassed what my goal was. <laughs> you don't say. Yes. <laughs> so she gifted other wives and girlfriends of NFL players use check originals, including Patrick Mahomes' wife, Brittany, Olympic great Simone Biles, and model Olivia Colpo. Men wanted in too, after Taylor Lautner reached out and showed off his custom Lions jacket during the playoffs. But did we mention he's not the only Taylor seen wearing one of Kristen's designs? What does it feel like to be a part of the Taylor Swift effect in real time? Oh, adrenaline. <laughs> so much adrenaline and just happiness. So how did one of Kristen's creations end up on the world's biggest pop star? She says she has Brittany Mahomes to thank. Brittany texted me and she said, hey, can you send me a video of Taylor's jacket? And I was like, wait, is there a possibility of you guys both wearing this? And she said, yeah, we're wearing it. And it was just such a pinch me moment. I mean... It just was incredible. Speculation of who made Taylor's jacket quickly spread across the internet. But leave it to Kristen's husband to set the record straight. Kyle, how many tweets do you think you responded to <laughs> dropping the mention of Kristen's name so that she got the recognition she deserved? I don't know the number, but um, I was hard at work that night. I just so badly wanted her to get the recognition that she deserved. As much credit as we'd like to give Taylor Swift, there's somebody else who you yeah. feel had a hand. So I lost my mom when I was 18. It's emotional for me, for sure. But so much of this just feels like divine. My mom, I just feel like, has just made this like fate for me. She's looking out for you. Yeah. Fate now sending the use checks into what they call a perfect storm, otherwise known as Super Bowl 58. I did make a Super Bowl puffer vest, and they're team neutral. We're launching them at an auction, and I'm going to donate all proceeds to um, the National Breast Cancer Foundation. I just feel like this is my mom, and I just need to give back in some way. My mom's name embroidered. On to the question we're all asking. Who else will be sporting a Use Check original at the Super Bowl? 
we have some exciting people coming up too for the Super Bowl. Any hints? Yeah. Hey, we're still working on it, but I know um, we got Kyle. Finally. <gasps> Finally! I, I know, I feel so bad. I made him something really special, and I think everyone's going to absolutely love it. Even though they'll be rooting for opposing teams, no matter the outcome of the game, Kristen will be forever grateful to Taylor Swift. She single-handedly catapulted my career. I've been at this for years. When I saw her walk out in that jacket, it just like brought me to tears. So cool. Our thanks to Kaylee Hartung for that report, believe it or not. But this all gets even better. Kristen was recently granted a license to use the NFL's official logo on her designs. Now she can actually be selling them, and she's, you know... Right. And I understand those are not easy to get either, no, so no. that's good. All Very right. exciting. <laughs> Coming up, early to bed, researchers have found an interesting trend when it comes to Gen Z and sleep. When we come back, we'll tell you why more young people are choosing to go to bed much earlier than before. This is Morning News Now. The Oscars are going to be casting a wider net in future years. The Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences just announced a new award to recognize casting directors. The cool. Best Achievement in Casting Award, actually the first new category since 2001. Films released next year will be eligible. That means the first official award will go out at the Oscars ceremony in 2026. I love that. Guys, when I'm watching movies, sometimes I'm like, wow, they were the perfect person for that role. I know, and now I want to kind of know more it. about how that process works behind totally. the scenes. Totally, yeah, very right. interesting. All right, finally this hour, when it comes to sleep, it seems Gen Z is certainly getting their Zs in. According to a survey conducted by the mattress company Sleep Number, people between the ages of 18 and 34 went to bed an average of 12 minutes earlier in January compared to a year ago. Gen Z. Another survey <laughs> just released by Rent Cafe found people in their 20s are getting an impressive nine and a half hours of sleep a night. That's around 45 minutes more than a decade ago. For more on this trend, let's bring in Dr. Anne-Marie Morse. She is a pediatric sleep medicine physician at Geisinger Medical Center and the spokesperson for the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Dr. Morse, thanks for joining us this morning. So what do you think is behind this trend? Is it like changing habits or is it that people are kind of being messaged at more that sleep's important for your health so they're kind of heeding that? So I think there actually are multiple different factors that are feeding into this trend. I think first and foremost, the Gen Zers especially have been recognized as the generation that is very focused on overall wellness, despite the fact of really entering adulthood through one of the world's biggest pandemics. Now, with that stated, one of the things that I would say was the silver lining of experiencing a pandemic where everyone was in lockdown was that we were a society of I will sleep when I'm dead, where very commonly I would respond to that saying, you're just going to get there a lot sooner, of people being forced to stay home and sleep what their bodies needed. What that led to was this aha moment of, I've been living a life of a lesser version of me. When I mm. actually started having regular duration of sleep that my body needed, I realized I was less moody, less irritable. My cognition was better. My relationship with my spouse or my kids or my friends were better, despite all of these negative things that I'm currently going through because the whole world is shut down. Hmm. This aha moment has led to people saying, now that we're on the other side of it, I want to maintain that feeling. That felt amazing. So, so we're seeing this with the younger generation. How about other older adults? Are they going to bed earlier or sleeping more? So in terms of other generations, one of the things that we have to recognize is as we get older, it does actually change our biologic need of how much sleep we need. So most typically when we're talking about that 18 to 64 year, year age range, it's seven to nine hours of sleep. As we get a little bit older than that, it starts to be seven to eight, and some are even struggling to get that seven. So we do see that despite the fact that the younger generation is doing a great job. Unfortunately, on a national level, we're still seeing that the trend of people with sleep disorders is only growing. So one of the things I would say I hope this does is a call to action to everyone to just look at their sleep and say, am I getting the right duration? Am I getting the right quality and the timing of sleep? And if not, partnering with your physician to identify what are the steps forward to mimic what the Gen Zers are doing. So as Joe said, some of them are even getting nine and a half hours of sleep. I mean, that that just does sound like a lot. Is there such thing as too much sleep? Can you give us a quick answer here? Apologize. We're tight on time. Sure. 
too much sleep is definitely a thing. And so when I'm seeing that, it either makes me wonder whether or not there's a quality issue or whether or not there may be something else leading to requiring that greater duration of sleep. Hmm. All right, Dr. Anne Marie Morse, fascinating stuff. Thanks for joining us. Let's get it for Thanks. this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Good morning and good news. It's Friday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, fired up and firing back. A defiant President Biden steps in front of the cameras to deliver a blistering response to that special counsel investigation into his handling of classified documents. The report concluding criminal charges were not warranted, but questioning the president's mental capabilities. There's even reference that I don't remember when my son died. How in the hell dare he raise that? I don't need anyone. I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away. We've got more from the report's politically toxic assessment and the president's counterattack. Former President Trump, on the other hand, racking up another caucus win in Nevada last night, according to our projection here at NBC News. That comes on the heels of a landmark Supreme Court hearing at stake. Will Mr. Trump remain on Colorado's primary ballot? So how might the justices rule? We're going to bring you the big takeaways from yesterday's hearing. We're just over 48 hours from Super Bowl 58 kicking off in Las Vegas. So how are both the Chiefs and 49ers preparing for their shot at NFL glory? We've got the full rundown later in the hour. Can't talk about the Super Bowl without mentioning the halftime show. Usher will take the stage on the heels of releasing his latest album today. We're going to touch on that and all the other big entertainment releases in your can't miss list. So many people are looking forward to that halftime performance. I can't wait. I mean, he has so many songs, when you, which always happens in the Super Bowl. I'm like, wow, like, Oh, that yeah, too. that's that right. Too. Yeah. Exactly. And then the surprise is who's going to join him. Looking forward to that. Let's begin this hour with the latest on special counsel, the special counsel's report on President Biden's handling of classified documents. Yeah, the president will not face charges for, quote, willfully retaining and disclosing classified materials as a private citizen. But Biden is now pushing back over special counsel Robert Hur's stinging assessment of his memory. NBC News chief White House correspondent Peter Alexander has the details. President Biden late Thursday trying to blunt the stinging assessment by special counsel Robert Hur coming before the cameras in what was an extremely rare nighttime news conference. Legally, no criminal charges are warranted, Hur said, but the political peril may be harder to contain with the special counsel focusing heavily on what he called the president's hazy memory. President Biden angry and defiant. My memory is fine. In a hastily called evening news conference, the president responding directly to special counsel Robert Hur's report on his handling of classified documents. Mr. President, on the document! That included a blistering assessment of the 81-year-old's age and what the report called his diminished faculties in advancing age. The president slamming Hur's assessment that he did not remember when his son Bo died. How in the hell dare he raise that? I don't need anyone. I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away. The remarks coming hours after the special counsel said our investigation uncovered evidence that President Biden willfully retained and disclosed classified materials after his vice presidency, but said no criminal charges are warranted in this matter. Adding that a jury would likely see the president as a sympathetic, well-meaning, and elderly man with a poor memory. I'm well-meaning, and I'm an elderly man, and I know what the hell I'm doing. Moments later, the president confusing Mexico and Egypt you know, when talking about the crisis in Gaza. The president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. The special counsel said Mr. Biden kept documents about Afghanistan marked classified and notebooks with handwritten entries implicating intelligence sources and methods. This, these assertions are not only misleading, they're just plain wrong. Prosecutors say these photos show classified documents improperly stored in a badly damaged box near a collapsed dog crate in the president's Delaware garage. 
A separate special counsel is investigating former President Trump's alleged mishandling of classified information found at his Mar-a-Lago estate. Mr. Trump, who has pleaded not guilty to 40 federal criminal counts, blasting the lack of charges against President Biden, calling it a two-tiered system of justice. But the Her report says there are clear differences, saying Mr. Biden alerted authorities about the documents and cooperated with the investigation, while Mr. Trump allegedly did the opposite, enlisting others to destroy evidence and then to lie about it. So why speak out? Late last night, White House official sources tell NBC News concluded that the president needed to address the special counsel's most damning allegations head on to show his anger. They found the attacks on his memory, in particular, in the words of one source, gratuitous and believed it was critical that the president call out what he see as purely political criticism from her, who they argue was concerned about potential backlash from conservatives for not charging President Biden with a crime. Back to you. All right, Peter, thank you. The Supreme Court is now weighing whether former President Trump can remain on the Republican primary ballot in Colorado. The justices seemed to express skepticism yesterday during the two-hour hearing at issue whether Colorado is right to say Mr. Trump should be barred from running for office, citing his actions on January 6th that led to the attack on the Capitol. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has the details. Hey there, we talk about the overlap between law and politics this year. Well, what's happening at the U.S. Supreme Court is Exhibit A. You have both the conservative and the liberal justices bristling at the very concept of kicking Donald Trump off the presidential ballot, all as he inches another step closer to securing the Republican nomination. Donald Trump notching another win overnight in Nevada, winning support from the majority of the state's Republican caucus goers, according to an NBC News projection appearing likely on the road to a legal victory as well. Our Supreme Court hopefully will be doing something in terms of helping our country and preserving democracy. And I think they had a very, very interesting day and a very beautiful day. A divided Supreme Court coalescing in their skepticism over an issue that could upend the presidential race, appearing unwilling to condone the effort to kick Mr. Trump off the presidential ballot. The question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. I mean, that seems quite extraordinary, doesn't it? Pointed questions like that one for the lawyer representing six voters in Colorado, who successfully managed to get the Republican frontrunner disqualified from the state's primary ballot under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which bans those who engaged in insurrection or rebellion from holding public office again. I've lived a hell of a long time, and I've gone through a lot of presidents, and this is the first one that is trying to destroy the Constitution. But Thursday's oral arguments less focused on whether Mr. Trump's actions amounted to an insurrection. Instead, the justices appearing more troubled by the prospect of affirming a single state court's decision that could have massive political ramifications nationwide. What about the idea that um, we should think about democracy, think about the right of the people to elect uh, candidates of their choice, uh, of letting the people decide? Because your position has the effect of disenfranchising uh, voters to a significant degree. As for the timing of when we might see a decision from the justices, they are well aware that Super Tuesday is coming up on March 5th. The voters from Colorado have asked for a decision very quickly as soon as this weekend. I would expect to see one well before Super Tuesday. Back to you. All right, Laura, thank you. For more on this case, we are joined by Catherine J. Ross, Professor Emeritus of Law at George Washington University Law School. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. So walk us through some of Trump's legal team's arguments to the Supreme Court. What do you think was their biggest selling point to the justices? Thank you for inviting me. Uh, they had, I, I would say, essentially four points, um, which did not appear either in the briefs or yesterday to have a great deal of merit, but the justices took them seriously. First, the court spent a lot of time on a really down in the legal weeds discussion of whether the president was an officer of the United States, which involved comparing different language in different parts of the Constitution. Um, it, it seems really illogical that the person who is charged with taking care that the laws of the nation are faithfully executed should be 
the only person who could serve uh, after an insurrection. Um, they also put a great deal of weight, uh, the, the team, uh, Trump's team, on a case that has no value as a precedent for the Supreme Court. It's a Civil War era, a Reconstruction era case in which uh, the circuit court, the Court of Appeals, made a ruling. And the person who wrote that opinion was actually a Supreme Court justice who later became the chief justice. And while he was chief justice, he wrote differently and repudiated his earlier decision in the circuit court. And circuit courts have no effect on what the Supreme Court does. The Supreme Court takes usually cases where the courts of appeals are not in agreement with each other, and it clarifies or states what the law should be. So that was something that Trump's team came back to over and over and over again, regardless of the nature of the question before the court. Um, then they said, um, after all, the 14th Amendment provides that the disqualification for an insurrectionist uh, can be lifted by Congress uh, by a vote of two thirds. And that is in fact, in the language of section three. And the Trump team's proposal was, we should have an election and let Congress worry later about disqualification. So what they had in mind was something that would lead to enormous chaos if not a second civil war, mm -hmm. because they're saying on January 6th of 2025, the Congress has it in its power not to certify the results of the Electoral College, but to decide at that point, oh no, the person who won and mm. who the Electoral College said is going to be the next president is disqualified because he was an insurrectionist and we don't want to uh, lift that disqualification by essentially pardoning him by a two-thirds vote. Mm. Right. It is really hard to imagine the court dealing with that question at that point while the clock is ticking to inauguration, and if disqualified, who will then be the president and the vice president? That is a recipe for disaster, and finally they said wasn't an insurrection. It was just, just a violent riot. Mm. All right, Professor Catherine Ross, thank you for joining us. Now to a conversation that is making headlines around the world. In an interview posted last night, former Fox News host Tucker Carlson sat down with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow. It was Putin's first interview with a Western-based media figure since before the war in Ukraine began. We should note that Carlson has consistently repeated falsehoods and misinformation. NBC News has not been given any details about the circumstances under which the interview was recorded, and the Russian to English translations were provided by the Tucker Carlson Network. NBC's chief international correspondent, Keir Simmons, has more on the story. Hey there, good day to you. For more than two hours, President Putin was allowed to focus on his favorite topics, history, the CIA, Ukraine, almost entirely unchallenged. His interviewer, Tucker Carlson, who in the past has expressed sympathy for President Putin, let the first answer run for around 30 minutes. With the war in Ukraine on a knife edge, President Putin says Russia has always wanted to talk. He has said that before. All the while continuing to pummel the country with drones, missiles and other weapons. We have never refused negotiations, indeed. The interview with conservative former Fox News host Tucker Carlson echoing talking points from Donald Trump's election campaign. Don't you have anything better to do? You have issues on the border. They are messages Putin has repeated time and time again, including in our interview before attacking Ukraine. Will you commit now not to send any further Russian troops into Ukrainian sovereign territory? You, the US, crossed an ocean with military equipment, he told me, and yet you believe somehow we are acting aggressively. But his invasion has killed and wounded hundreds of thousands of people in Ukraine and Russia. He said again that he is looking to do a deal over jailed Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich, this time clearly signaling that Russia wants to exchange the American journalist for a Russian FSB assassin jailed in Germany. I do not rule out that the person you refer to, Mr. Gershkovich, may return to his motherland.
This morning, the Wall Street Journal saying in a statement, Evan is a journalist and journalism is not a crime. We're encouraged to see Russia's desire for a deal that brings Evan home and we hope this will lead to his rapid release. NBC News continues to report from Russia. Last month, we travelled to a Putin event as he stands for election with a small, hand-picked audience. I'll vote for Putin, this woman told us later, comparing the Ukraine war with the war on terrorism. This week, a candidate we met in December who opposes the Ukraine war was banned from the election. President Putin's objectives with this interview will have included to influence the debate in Washington. Congress still hasn't approved more funding for Ukraine and to influence his own voters ahead of his election in March. Russian media is already celebrating the interview. The headline with the state news agency TASS, Putin is trending on X. All right, Kier, thank you. Well, President Biden says Israel's military action in Gaza has, quote, been over the top. In some of his sharpest criticism yesterday, Biden told reporters there were, quote, a lot of innocent people starving and dying, and it's got to stop. The rebuke comes as the Biden administration warns Israel about its looming ground offensive on Rafah, the city where more than a million Palestinians have fled to. NBC's Raf Sanchez has this story. As fighting rages in the city of Han Yunus, Israel threatening to mount a major new ground assault, this time on Rafa, Gaza's southernmost city, wedged against the border with Egypt. Our soldiers are now in Han Yunus, Hamas's main stronghold. They'll soon go into Rafa, Hamas's last bastion. Israel says many of Hamas's surviving fighters are hiding in the city. But more than a million Palestinian civilians, half the population of Gaza, are also sheltering in Rafah. Many of them already displaced from their homes in the north by the fighting. It's also home to the border crossing with Egypt, Gaza's vital lifeline for food and international aid, and the only way out of the Strip. With housing in Rafa desperately short, this family taking refuge in a chicken coop. Live birds sleeping a few feet away. Lena and her little sister picking a spot out of the rain. I want to see our home and my school. I want to go back to playing games with my siblings. I want to go back to our home and to our beds, she tells us. The White House sounding the alarm over a potential assault. Any major military operation in Rafa at this time, under these circumstances, with more than a million, probably more like a million and a half Palestinians who are seeking refuge and have been seeking refuge in Rafa, without due consideration for their safety, uh, would be a disaster. Our cameras were at Rafa's Kuwaiti hospital as the wounded from one strike were rushed in. This was the moment Dr. Rame Abu Libde realized his own son, Mohammed, was among the injured. Where's your mom, he asks. The whole house came down, the boy replies. It's only later he can get out the words. She's injured, but alive. We headed into southern Gaza with Israeli forces, following them into a tunnel they say was used by Hamas leaders. The scale of these tunnels is just stunning. You walk in the darkness minute after minute, and the tunnel goes on and on and on. You... Israel believes many of Hamas's weapons were smuggled into Gaza across the Egyptian border near Rafah. How can you fight there without causing mass casualties of innocent people? We'll have to find a way if we go there. I'm a military commander. In a democratic country, I take my orders from my democratic government. But you know as a soldier, there's no way to fight in a place where there are a million civilians without a lot of innocent people being killed. I agree, but we're fighting Hamas, who's hiding among civilians. And I think you have to refer that question to the Hamas on why are they hiding among the civilians. A million civilians in the line of fire with nowhere to run. Our thanks to Raf Sanchez for that report. President Biden also said last night that he was pushing very hard to secure the hostage ceasefire deal, despite Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying they would fight on. Back in the U.S., a grand jury has now indicted seven people linked to that attack on two officers in New York's Times Square last month. The Manhattan DA announced yesterday five of the suspects indicted face felony charges. Four of them face second-degree assault charges. The attack happened as officers were trying to disperse a crowd. Authorities say they're still searching for four more people suspected of assaulting the officers. 
Let's now get a check on your morning news and how weather with Michelle Grossman. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, guys. Great to see you. And we are warming up today in portions of the east. Lots of us, 10, even 30 degrees above normal for this time of year. That's one of the bigger weather stories on this Friday. Also looking at a really active west still. We're looking at snow in the Intermountain West. We're looking at snow in the Rockies. The northern central Rockies could see anywhere from six inches to a foot of snow there. We're also looking at some stormy weather in parts of Texas, western Texas, into Tennessee. That's going to expand as we go throughout Saturday and also Sunday. So we do have a flood chance this weekend in portions of the south. So that is today. Then as we near tomorrow, there's the rain I was talking about, heavy rain in some spots, Texas, into Mississippi, uh, Arkansas, into the Tennessee Valley, where you see those brighter colors. That's where we're expecting heavier rain. Could see three to four inches over the next couple of days, and that could lead to some flash flooding. Also could see some stormy weather, too. Any of these storms could bring some damaging winds, also some hail. But notice that that rain does stretch into portions of the Ohio Valley and the interior parts of the Northeast as well. The Intermountain West still uh, looking at snow. The Rockies as well, but we are still dry along the west coast of California, so that's good news. Then by Sunday, still stormy in parts of the south. We're looking at heavy rain on the backside of the system. So in parts of the southern plains, looking at some snow in parts of uh, Texas, even Oklahoma. But most of this will be rain in the south into the southeast. And again, could see some flooding rains and could see some strong storms on Sunday. Let's talk about the Super Bowl forecast because it looks really good. Temperature Temperature is 53 degrees. That seems pretty perfect for a football game. Lots of sunshine. I looked up the winds. The winds are going to be light as well. So a really good uh, kickoff game there. Now, we'll end it here, guys, because we're looking at temperatures really warm, and we're going to see temperatures into the 60s in parts of the Mid-Atlantic, also in the Northeast, and we'll see that once again tomorrow. Back to you both. All right. Thank you so much, Michelle. Much more to come here on this Friday edition of Morning News Now, including the chief executives of some big pharma companies grilled on Capitol Hill yesterday over skyrocketing drug prices, how they defended their business practices. But first, there's the growing controversy surrounding plans to give one of the wonders of the ancient world a makeover. We've got those stories and more up next. We are back with a look at controversial plans to restore one of the wonders of the ancient world. Egypt's government wants to study and restore the exterior to the smallest of the three pyramids of Giza. But some archaeologists argue the makeover might do more harm than good. Here's NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter. Hey guys, good morning. Ignoring this weather, we're going to take you to sunnier climes to a controversy brewing at one of the most famous sites in the world and the battle over conservation versus restoration. Take a look. Built more than 4,500 years ago, they're magnificent. But now there's a controversial project underway to give one of Egypt's iconic pyramids of Giza a facelift. And many Egyptologists aren't happy. Last month, Dr. Mustafa Waziri announced a plan to restore the Mankure Pyramid, the smallest of the three world-famous structures. The project uses laser technology to recase the pyramid with granite blocks found on site scattered at its base. But after swift backlash, work has been paused. UNESCO, which protects the site, says they were unaware of the project, and an international scientific committee will now review the plan. Egyptologists like Dr. Monica Hanna argue recladding the pyramid is unscientific and tantamount to tampering with Egyptian antiquities. The bottom section of the pyramid was faced with a different kind of stone, with a granite stone. Now, if you undo that and you try to put those in place, are you putting those blocks into the right place or in the wrong place? Archaeologists excavate sites all the time to uncover our history, but there's a difference between conservation and restoration. When you restore something, you're, you're actually removing the antiquity. You're beautifying something beyond the ruin, beyond the antiquity that it is. You're perfecting it, and you're making something that, that didn't exist. Heading up the new committee is Dr. Zahi Awas. Back in 2021, he granted us exclusive access to a lost city buried for thousands of years near Luxor. And it was just under sand. Under sand. The amazing thing now is what we found inside the city. The second most important discovery after King Tut's tomb in 1922. But when does the modern hand go too far, even in the name of preserving ancient history? 
Now, critics also argue this may all be a stunt to boost tourism. The country is looking to double its annual visitor count to 30 million people by 2028. Also later this spring, we are finally expecting the opening of the Grand Egyptian Museum, delayed for years, hopefully opening later this spring, also out in Giza. I'll send back to you guys. All right, Molly, thank you so much. More international headlines now, starting with the latest results from Pakistan's elections. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Labanga joins us from Rome with that and more. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning. Well, that's right. The first results from yesterday's parliamentary election in Pakistan actually arrived only after 10 hours after the polls closed. Well, the reason, at least according to the Election Commission of Pakistan, was uh, due to an internet problem. Now, the initial partial results show it's still a close race between the party of Nawaz Sharif, the three-time former prime minister, and the party of another former prime minister, Imran Khan, who was jailed last August in a corruption case and for leaking state secrets. Now, the Election followed a wave of violence at election offices and polling stations across the country, both in the run-up to the polls and on election day. Let's go to Ukraine now, where President Zelensky announced the dismissal of Ukraine's top commander, General Valery Zaluzny. On paper, the decision appears consensual and amicable. On Telegram, the general wrote that urgent changes were needed in the army, while Zelensky said that he is grateful for his consent and proposed him to continue working for the Ukrainian state. But the announcement followed weeks of reported tension between the two, especially following the mainly unsuccessful counteroffensive last year. So it's not clear if the general was fired, he resigned, or was forced to resign. And let's end this tour of the world in Iceland, where a volcano has erupted for the third time since December. It is the same volcano that at the end of the year, or last year, forced the evacuation of a coastal town, that of Grindavik. A video from uh, Iceland's Coast Guard shows fountains of lava soaring more than 165 feet into the night and a plume of vapor rising half a mile over the volcano. This latest eruption triggered the evacuation of the popular Blue Lagoon geothermal spa and temporarily cut heat and hot water to thousands of people, but fortunately, nobody was reported injured. Mm. Back to you guys. Fire and ice. All right, Claudio, Easy thank pictures. you so much. Coming up, a whole lot of us have Super Bowl fever heading into the weekend, and this year the big game could have more than a few new viewers. Of course, that's thanks to Taylor Swift, but just how massive is her Swifty sway? We're going to break it down next. On Sunday, a lot of first-time viewers are expected to tune in. That is thanks to a certain group of super fans. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa takes a look at the Swift effect. America's biggest sporting event of the year is about to get even bigger with the help of Swifties. <laughs> Flourishing fans of football since Taylor Swift started publicly dating Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey. <laughs> driving the NFL to score its highest regular season viewership among women on record. Taylor is obviously a dynamo. Everything she touches, there are people following. Particularly in the Chiefs' hometown. She has put Kansas City, Missouri on the map. Everyone loves a love story, especially small businesses like the Pink Dinosaur here, now seeing unprecedented sales. It's never been like this before. Kansas City is so excited. We have the Chiefs, now we have Taylor. References to trailer are stitched into shirts, strung on bracelets. In 87 was super cute. Even baked into cakes and cookies at McLean's. We really do have a whole new customer base. We're getting calls from a bunch of gals getting together, having Taylor Swift um, Super Bowl watch parties. And there will be plenty of those on Sunday. I really didn't enjoy football the same until Taylor was involved, I'll be real. <laughs> With lyrics, games, and of course... And we have friendship bracelet station. One marketing group estimates the pair's budding romance has generated a brand value of more than $330 million for the Chiefs in NFL, a courtship catching attention around the world in Japan, where Swift is performing this week. Go, go, Travis! Before she's expected to return for a Super Bowl of Swifties' wildest dreams. Emily Ikeda, NBC News.
Let's stick with the Super Bowl and all the entertainment in store for fans. Of course, Usher headlining with his first solo performance at the big game. But many of other musical acts, as Kaylee reported, are set to take the stage in some form or fashion in Vegas. Andrew Unterberger is deputy editor at Billboard, joins us with a look ahead at all the entertainment. Andrew, good to have you with us. So, Usher, he only gets 13 minutes, but you can do a lot <laughs> in 13 minutes. Any idea what we can expect and whether he's going to have any special guests and surprises? Yeah. I think the special guests are going to play a really big part in it. He's he's teased that pretty extensively throughout the sort of pre-show press he's done, uh, and he's got a ton to choose from. I, I think uh, you can expect probably uh, sort of top of that list will be Little John and Ludacris, who's got a couple of signature hits alongside uh, Alicia Keys for doing My Boo. I think is probably a pretty good bet, uh, and uh, Summer Walker mm -hmm. and Twenty One Savage. I think uh, for their for their first newest hit, which is called Good Good. Uh, I think those are all pretty likely candidates, but he's got, again, a good half dozen to choose from among his biggest hits. I think the home run picks, uh, if, if they're available, would be Beyonce for the Lovin's Club remix, uh, oh, part two of that wow. song. Good call. Justin Bieber, maybe. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's, it's, again, plenty to choose from. Going to be a lot of recognizable faces out there, I think. The beauty of so many collaborations. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. When the artist is doing the halftime show, you're like, oh, yeah, that song. Oh, yeah, that song. There's so many good ones. Also, you just mentioned that he's out with new music. He just had this Las Vegas residency. It's obviously been a huge year generally for him, headed on tour also. How major do you think the Super Bowl performance is for him, also in kind of just making some of those other things, his new release, tour, more successful? It's kind of the culmination of what's been a really good past few years for Usher. You know, he he had a bit of a lull there uh, where, where he wasn't really having hits in quite the same way as he, he had been. Uh, but now he's sort of back. I think people sort of recognize the legacy uh, of his 30 years of, of hit making. Uh, and they realize that he's actually still performing at a really high level, both in the live sense with this, this really successful Vegas residency. And he's also got his biggest hit in about a decade uh, with Good Good. Uh, the new album's out today. I think it's really good. I think it's really strong. Uh, and he's going out on tour. This 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 halftime gig is going to be a really good showcase of what he can do. Uh, yeah, it's a good year to be Usher. So you're saying good good's good? <laughs> I, I am saying the good good is good. That's right. <laughs> Just making sure here. So also this year, for the first time, the Super Bowl has a DJ. It was supposed to be Tiesto, but he had to drop out. What more can you talk uh, about the DJ we're going to have? Well, yeah, so it's tough to say what exactly it's going to include because we've never really had a, 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 an official Super Bowl halftime DJ or Super Bowl DJ before. But yeah, Tiesto, uh, one, one of the biggest names in dance music, he had to drop out due to a family emergency. And instead, uh, they're replacing him with Cascade, who's another one of the biggest names in dance music. Maybe a little bit less familiar to mainstream audiences because he hasn't had the sort of crossover top 40 hits that Tiesto's had. But very respected among mm -hmm. the, the house community, the progressive house community. Uh, I, I think it's a good pick, and, and certainly w whatever whatever the gig entails, he's going to be up for the challenge. And so it kind of sounds like what it's just like making it a party the whole time for those in attendance in you know actually in the stadium. Yeah, probably coming in and out of commercial breaks is where we'll see it the most at home, uh, and certainly maybe a little bit more uh, while while setting up for the halftime show and, and winding down from that. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to find out exactly what it's like to be in the building for it. And Billboard actually has a, a correspondent that's going to be embedded with him. So we can read more all Ooh. about that later, I guess. Oh, wow. That's very cool. Very quickly, who are you most excited for? Uh, who am I most excited for? In, Performance at the show? wise. No, just like throughout all the weekend, everything we know that's going on. No, I'm, I'm excited for Russian. I'm excited to see who he brings out. I've been a fan for a very long time, pretty much my entire music listening life. I think he's going to put on a great show. I, I think he's going to really show people what he's capable of. And it's, it's going to, be, again, it's going to be that culmination of really what's been a really half a really good half decade of ramping up to, to, to back to superstardom for Usher. And that's where he belongs. He, he's been one of the greatest, uh, greatest pop stars we've had the last 30 years. Andrew Unterberger, very exciting stuff to come this weekend. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Coming up, Big Pharma was on Capitol Hill yesterday. After the break, we'll bring you what some top CEOs had to say about America's drug price crisis. That's next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. The CEOs of three major pharmaceutical companies faced sharp questioning from senators yesterday. They testified at a committee hearing over high prescription drug prices. Prices so high, lawmakers say many Americans just can't afford the medications they need to survive. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles has the details. We're going to go forward. On Capitol Hill, the heads of companies behind popular drugs like Eliquis, Keytruda, and Stellara pressed on the rising cost of medication. Will you commit to lowering the price of Keytruda in the United States to the price of Japan? 
Well, Senator, I, I think um, first I acknowledge the prices in the United States are higher uh, than they are in many of the countries you said, and, and not for all drugs, but for many drugs, and that, that's the reality we face. The top executives of Johnson & Johnson, Merck, and Bristol-Myers Squibb asked to explain why some of their life-saving drugs are two and a half times more expensive in the U.S. than in other countries. You get access in the United States faster and more than anywhere in the world. Because of cost, more than 9 million Americans a year report not taking medications as prescribed. Jacqueline Garbay is one of them. She suffers from a chronic autoimmune disease. To afford the drugs she needs, her parents delayed retirement in order to keep her on their insurance. Without my medication, I could lose the ability to walk by the end of my 20s. The drug company execs also said their profits go back into research and development for new drugs. But committee chairman Bernie Sanders says the company spend more in stock buybacks, dividend payments, and executive compensation than on R&D. So what can Congress do? What Congress could do... Ryan, it is not going to do. It's not just the greed of the pharmaceutical industry, it's the inactivity of the Congress. Leaving patients like Jacqueline, whose aunt died of the same disease she is dealing with, filled with anxiety. So, that threat is always looming over my head. Our thanks to Ryan Nobles for that report. Well, Senator Sanders is not holding out hope for a legislative fix. Both Republicans and Democrats do seem open to the idea of finding a way to reform the role pharmacy benefits managers play in the cost of prescription drug prices. Right now to some financial headlines. Delta is upgrading your travel experience in certain airports. CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us once again with that and other money news. Bertha, good morning. I'm so tempted to talk about pharmacy benefit management, but my husband always says when I start talking about PBMs, people's eyes glaze over. So let's move on to the news. Delta Airlines uh, plans to open a new tier of premium airport lounges in New York, Los Angeles, and Boston this year. The first one will be open at New York's JFK Airport in June. Delta hasn't disclosed what the eligibility requirements are going to be. It's been building up its network of Sky Clubs to accommodate the surge of travelers as more people gain entry through memberships, airline status, credit card benefits, or flying premiums. Last year, Delta said that it was going to limit entry to Sky Labs, but then, or Sky Lounges rather, but they had to make some alterations because there was a big uproar. Meantime, Hawaiian Airlines is rolling out free Wi-Fi through SpaceX's Starlink service on board commercial flights this week. It's the first major U.S. airline to offer the satellite-based Wi-Fi. Hawaiian is an extensive, has an extensive network of flights over the Pacific Ocean, serving the mainland U.S., Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and other destinations from Hawaii. Airlines have been ramping up their high-speed Wi-Fi service. JetBlue offers Wi-Fi on board for free, and Delta launched in-flight free internet for its loyalty members last year. And Fireball Whiskey has released its first ever custom lipstick inspired by the IT superstar couple. Yeah, that's right. Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. The brand says it was only natural to create cinnamon delight. As Swift is known for sporting red lipstick and Kelsey drank Fireball while celebrating the Chiefs win in the Super Bowl last year. The lipstick features Fireball's signature red color with cinnamon flavor and aroma. It retails for $13.87, a combo of Swift's lucky <laughs> number and Kelsey's jersey number. I, I, I mean, this stuff is just going so far. Apparently, there's some, some chapel saying, if your names are... Taylor and Travis, you can come here and get married for free in Vegas. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Wow. I don't think they'll do that. But... <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, we love it. All right. Thank you, Bertha. Thanks. Appreciate it. Well, here in New York, Fashion Week kicks off today with designers from all over the world ready to show off their most exclusive and often expensive designs. But for fashion lovers on a budget, there is an alternative to shopping for the latest styles. NBC News Now anchor Zinkley Asamoah takes a look at the latest developments in the clothing rental market. Let's explain rental clothing. I started a business where I rent my fancy clothes to teens, so if you see a 14-year-old kid wearing a Louis Vuitton cravat, you know who to thank, me. It's the process of purchasing clothes for a fixed amount of time, then returning them. Put simply, it's like borrowing clothes from a friend for a price. Economists predict the rental market will grow from $1.77 billion to $2.47 billion by 2029. The sell? Customers can rent luxury clothing for a fraction of the price. 
Today, there are a variety of rental companies customers can choose from, like Rent the Runway or Newly. Some have apps, and others also have brick and mortar stores, like Pickle, right here in downtown Manhattan. We're a peer to peer rental marketplace, so we don't own any of the inventory. Pickle attempting to reinvent the rental clothing market faced with negative growth during the pandemic. Pickle connects customers to each other, picking up in store, getting items delivered, or meeting in person. Thank you. The process of renting clothes is not new. Quick history lesson references to rental evening wear popped up in U.S. newspapers as early as the 1800s, with 17th century references to customers renting elaborate aristocratic garb. In modern times, rental clothing goes far beyond tuxedos for men. Rent the Runway was the first company to really come out and make this a thing. It's fun to think about all of the places these clothes are going to go. And then they started moving into everyday wear, office wear, all of these different things. But many customers left the practice behind after the pandemic. You can tell that people either like aren't washing things correctly. The materials are just so worn down. Sustainability experts also raising concerns about high carbon emissions from shipping and harmful chemicals used in dry cleaning for rentals. I do think it's headed in the same direction as fast fashion, more about just churning through this new stuff all the time. Rental companies committing to measures like energy efficient washing machines, use of gentle cleaning solutions, upcycling landfill waste, reusable bags, carbon offsets, local pickup options, and more. And today, demand for rentals continues to grow. Urban Outfitters newly reporting a 149% increase in subscribers in 2023, with newcomer Pickle planning to open new storefronts this year. Rental is I believe the future of fashion. These items don't have to always live in your own closet. Our thanks to Zinclay for that report. Well, coming up, yeah, sure, the Super Bowl is this weekend. Get this, though. So is the Puppy Bowl. The long-standing companion to the big game turns 20 this year. Oh. And apart from the endlessly adorable entertainment, it is all for a good cause. We've got a little preview next. We are back with an adorable alternative to the Super Bowl this weekend. That's right. The Chiefs and the 49ers are not the only ones hitting the field this Sunday. It's also Puppy Bowl 20. <laughs> this thing just cracks me up. The event was created to encourage animal adoption, and it's the biggest one yet. This year, 131 rescue pups are coming from all over the country to compete on either Team Rough or Team Fluff. Dogs can score points by crossing the goal line with a toy. Puppies can even face penalties for things like trash, barking, and unsport-like dog conduct. But these little ones are standing in line, all thanks to this year's first-ever assistant referee. Get this longtime puppy bull ref, Dan Schockner. You might recognize him. He adopted his first dog named Whistle, who will be assisting him. <laughs> it's like adorable you? chaos. Love the matching outfits. All right, finally this hour, if it's Friday, it means it's time for your weekly can't-miss list. Yeah, if you plan on watching more than just the Super Bowl this weekend, we've got all the other stuff, the movies, the shows, songs that you just can't miss. And to fill us in on all the details, from L.A. is TV host and pop culture expert Andrew Freund. Andrew, good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. All right, so let's start with this one that's getting, I'm seeing it on billboards all over the place, walking down the street in New York, Lisa Frankenstein. Yeah. It's a comedy horror from Diablo Cody. What can you tell us about it? Yeah, Joe, you know, when I read the logline for this film, I was like, this is a Joe Fryer kind of film <laughs> because <laughs> it's a coming-of-age love story about a young girl and her crush, but her crush happens to be a really hot dead corpse. So, I, obviously, Joe, I thought of you. <laughs> um, but it's written by Diablo Cody, who wrote Jennifer's Body. It's also directed by Zelda Williams, the daughter of Robin Williams. And it's a very funny film kind of about, you know, think about those 80s movies like Beetlejuice, very Tim Burton-esque um, with very comedic moments. I actually really, really enjoyed this film, um, and it's super, super fun. And Cole Sprouse, who plays the corpse, is hilarious and has very um, interesting grunts and grunts groans throughout the film. Oh, I didn't realize that's who the corpse is. Wow. Okay, this looks yeah. awesome to me. I can't wait to see it. Um, let's turn to a thriller set in prehistoric times, getting rave reviews. It's called Out of the Darkness. Tell us about this. Yeah, so Out of the Darkness, to be quite honest, scared the bejesus out of me. Um, it's set, it's basically a caveman horror film, if that's like a genre now, <laughs> but it's set 45,000 years in the past, and it's about this group of in early humans who find land only to discover that they're being hunted by a sinister force. What do you guys think about that? Mm, I'm not sure. 
I, I don't know. It looks. It does look scary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. So let's uh, talk streaming. Tokyo Vice back for a second season on Mask. The first episode is already getting people talking. What can we expect with this one? Yeah, so this is season two of Tokyo Vice, and really this is kind of a show that not many people are watching right now that everybody, sh that everyone really should. It stars Ansel Elgort, and it's a t the true story of a journalist during the 90s who worked for Japan's largest newspaper, and he was the only Caucasian person working in this newspaper in Japan. Cut to, he gets put on the crime beat, and he gets to learn about the inner workings of the Japanese underworld crime syndicates. And, you know, he's this white guy working in this world in Japan, so you really get to learn a lot about what went on during that time. And as I said, it's based off a memoir of a journalist who really did this fascinating, fascinating show that more people really should be watching. Mm, it looks, I do want to watch that. I have also been meaning to go back and start season one. Um, all right, tell us. We've got something out of Sundance, which is always pretty cool. Suncoast streaming on Hulu. Got some big stars. What are people saying about this? Tell us what it is. Yeah, so Suncoast is also based off a true story from the director, and it's about a young girl who had to care for her terminally ill brother. Stars Laura Linney, who plays the mother. Now, the mother is a bit unhinged, and she puts a lot of responsibility on the daughter to take care of the son, obviously because the son is dying of a terminal illness. And this all takes place within a hospice called Suncoast during the time of Terry Schiavo. So if you guys remember mm -hmm. back in the early 2000s, the, ter the Terry Schiavo case um, about right to live. And so it raises a lot of ethical questions. And in the film, the young girl meets Woody Harrelson who plays a right to life activist. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's an interesting one right there. All right, yeah. finally, of course, we have to talk about Usher, he dropped a new album full of collaborations just ahead of the big Super Bowl halftime show this weekend. Uh, what track should we be listening to? What's standing out about his new album? So this is Usher's ninth studio album. This is quite possibly probably the biggest weekend of his entire life. It is filled with collabs like Lotto, like Her, one of the guys from BTS is on it, and it has 20 songs, all new. Fans have been waiting for this for years. This weekend is all about Usher, T-Swift, Kelsey, the Niners, the Chiefs. I mean, you know, guys, it's all going to be Super Bowl all the time this weekend. There you go. <laughs> I feel like a BTS appearance at the Super Bowl. Th that's what some people one. are wondering, yeah. right? Whether, yeah, that we'll see a little bit of that. Or, yeah. I don't, that's going to be the fun part. Like, who's going to pop that's out? Cool. Of course, Usher has I'm, been that person before. Right. He's been the one who's appeared when someone else is yeah. performing. So we'll and see. So many, he's I'm, collaborated I'm with guessing so many Little John. Yeah, oh, that's a good little John. Yeah. I think that's yeah. a good one. Little yeah. John, maybe Ludacris. I think that, yeah, could be a safe bet. If Beyonce <laughs> and Love in the Club happened, oh my lord. <laughs> I mean, come. I mean, come on. You're making my dreams come true. I know, today. right? I mean, All right. Yeah. Andrew Freud, thank you so much. Enjoy the Super Bowl. That's gonna do it for this hour of morning news. Now, stay with us. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.